Okay, second up today on the opening day of this show, we have uh, a local South East Queensland legend right here on stage with us right now. This is Jeff Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, hands together, please. What an afternoon. And it's an afternoon. Yeah, we're rocking on with the second half of the day already. Um, so um, I've known Jeff for a good few years. I've sort of admired him through the usual social media networks. And you sort of see these people that go and achieve huge amounts out in the big outdoor world. When I talk big outdoor world, okay, we're talking about the, the wilderness. We're talking about the cold. We're talking about the dark. We're talking about the extremities of the planet. Um, Jeff has been on a number of longest unsupported missions by himself and with a very close cohort of like-minded adventurers over the years. So for the next half an hour, I want to dig deep into Jeff's world and find out what inspires and motivates and fuels and, uh, and makes these missions possible. So um, I think the first point of call is um, Jeff and, and the early years, because you don't just rock up and suddenly become an Antarctic explorer. Um, Jeff, just talk to us about how the passion of adventure was ignited in you and how Africa was a big part of that. Yeah, I think Africa, like a lot of adventurers, I think start in Africa. It's a sort of continent that lends itself to exploration and adventure. And as a young boy, uh, my father was a veterinary officer. Uh, in East Africa, so his job was to fly all over Kenya, Tanzania, taking blood from camels. So I was offering his little sidekick, and I think that really kind of stimulated that you know wonder for the great outdoors and a love for adventure. Um, also, I think in Africa, it's probably less outlandish what I do. I think in Australian culture, what I do is fairly out of the box, but uh, in Africa, often that's what you have to do to get from A to B, so it's uh, more accepted. Um, I think in Australia, it's becoming more and more accepted to be uh, an outdoorsman, um, and you know, Wild Earth absolutely is a key promoter of that outdoor lifestyle, and they've been a, a great support to me, but yeah, it all started in Africa. And I can definitely reinforce that. I mean, I, having grown up in the UK, pretty an insulated lifestyle, you know, adventure is really more about getting in a tent and going to the north of Scotland in the summer, which is always wet, drizzly and, and miserable. Um, and that's about as extreme as it sort of gets as, a, as an outdoor adventure youth growing up there. And then my first touch point with Africa, when my Land Rover there, Colonel Mustard, touched wheels on the north of Morocco, that was when suddenly I realised that life is a lot more raw and untamed and unpredictable. And I think that's where you build your psyche and your mentality and your ability to grasp and take on the big stuff. Um, so from the warmth of Africa and this amazing continent to then, how do you build up a passion for this stuff that we're seeing on screen? The big glacial ice flows and taking yourself on adventures like that. Where does that conduit happen? Oh, I think there was a transition there. You know, your first adventures are with a group of mates and then um, by nature of the cost of funding some of these expeditions, you're kind of whittled down to a team of one. Uh, because that is, you know, for each person to get to Antarctica, you could spend anywhere from a couple of hundred grand to 500 grand, depending on the expedition. Uh, so, you know, the age of exploration, they had that incredible ability to fill a sailboat and get a whole bunch of like-minded men down there and women. Uh, now we're often uh, flying into Antarctica at great expense. And then uh, for me, it was important for it to be a carbon neutral <laughs> journey. Uh, so not using vehicles at all. And my passion was to go from the Antarctic coast through the South Pole to the coast. And uh, my great hero, Borjus Land, uh, who I'll be joining in the Arctic in less than a month, um, was probably the Norwegian explorer with most records for any explorer alive. Um, he set the record in 1997 at 67 days for the fastest coast to coast crossing through the South Pole. And I remember ringing him and saying, Mr. Borg, uh, I'm a little known Australian explorer. Um, I would like to train with you and I'd like you to train me to be your record. And he's like, well, this guy's a little cheeky. Uh, calling me to get me to train him to beat his record. Uh, but always, you know, a very humble guy. He said, listen, um, I'm actually talking in uh, Washington the time that you want to train, but I'll, I'll coordinate your training and I want you to start in the north of Canada, uh, play a little town called Iqaluit. That's where you're going to start your cold weather survival training. So three months later, I land in this most remote part of northern Canada on the edge of Baffin Island, 
uh, in an Inuit village that really doesn't have much, but a thousand huskies on the ice. Uh, incredible tides, so the ice layer goes up 15 metres and down 15 metres. Uh, the dogs sleep on the ice, you sleep on the ice with the dogs, and then there's a smattering of huts on the edge of a hill. Uh, it's a wet cold that drills into you, and it's the perfect training ground for anything polar because it's it's brutal, it's windy, it's wet, and it's you know obviously cold. So that's where the uh, the training began. Which year was this? When was this one? Oh, this would have been 2012. So I started my first real cold solo polar journey in 2013, finished in 2014 and beat Borges' record by 13 days. How was he about that with a uh, man coming from a very hot continent taking on the Norwegians at their own game? Well, that's the fun thing. It's a really a Jamaican bobsled kind of story. Um, so, you know, training on the beaches of Corumban, pulling tyres. Um, I remember strapping two skis together, drilling a hole in the end of them, two water skis, and kiting offshore, hauling a sled in the water, just to get used to that up-down motion, you know, you, we have no ice to train on. Uh, so to go down there and uh, knock two weeks off a, a record that had stood for, you know, nine or 20 years was pretty amazing. Your power source for that one. Obviously there's you and you're hauling some of the sleds which are over here and your suits and things are over here. But um, in terms of your power source, I've noticed obviously on your social media channels that kiting is a huge part of your 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 power source for not just the stuff on the ice but also on the water. Talk to us about how you got into the kiting world and what that looks like from dragging you over the continents. Well, um, Colonel Mustard there probably went through a similar route, but in, Jesus, you got me now, it would, would have been 20, 2009, we landed uh, with a bunch of vehicles on the north of Morocco and then drove through the Atlas Mountains to the start of the Sahara Desert. And the idea of that journey was to have two Aussies racing two Kiwis to be the first to cross the Sahara Desert only using wind power. And at that point, I had probably spent less than 10 hours on a kite. So the idea is that we had a really proficient kiter, one of the best in the world, um, Gar Freeman, uh, on my team, and he was to teach me and coach me over the journey. And then uh, Woogie Hansen, who was a, uh, a builder of kites, uh, one of the best kites in the world on the Kiwi team, with uh, an adventure racer, Steve Gurney, who was an incredibly tough campaigner but hadn't flown a lot of kites on his team. The secret there was that the Kiwi had been privately getting tuition for the month before we flew, and as soon as we landed, I realised that he was a way better kite than me. And under pressure, I had to lift my game. So the first 10 days, they were smashing us. They were kilometres ahead, and uh, we passed them. Uh, at one point, then they passed us about day 10. I was starting to get more proficient and then suddenly found this incredible finesse with the kite, uh, which has lasted with me for a long, long time. And we what's, learned... What's in contact on the sand? What are you on the oh, sand? You're, 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 no, it's in a three-wheel buggy, so you've got two big balloon tyres and you're steering with your feet. The difficulty in the Sahara was that the wind would often run from early afternoon right through to early morning. So a lot of the time you're navigating through channel country with big 400 foot drop offs and acacia thorns in the dark, flying a kite on double length lines because the wind was so light. So if you can fly a kite in the Sahara Desert, uh, you can fly anywhere in the world. And that was the, the cauldron that taught me how to, to finesse a kite. And I think that the secret for me is most of the guys in Antarctica are phenomenal skiers, but they've never spent enough time fine handling a kite in light air. So they might spend a couple of months training in the north of Norway in strong wind. Anybody can fly a kite in strong wind. Where I made my mileage was on those days where you couldn't feel wind on your face. Um, and I would double my line length and run backwards to get the kite off the deck. And then you're, you're playing in this light air at eight, you know, 50 to 80 metres off the deck. And then where any other explorer might be in the tent, waiting for wind, I was making 10, 15, 20 kilometres an hour. So when it's going well and the kite's flying and you've got taut strings and you're being pulled across, everything's great. But then you get to your obstacles and your hurdles of where obviously there's absolutely no wind or you've got a portage, you've got to go over something or through the water. Talk to us about the toughest parts of those journeys when it really is, God, I've really got to pull my wits about me and be the best version of myself now. Yeah, and I think for me, my morale has always been linked to the kite. So if I'm making distance, I'm heading where I want to go, 
I'm uh, able to make that, that ground, my morale is high. When the kite is out of the sky, it's the fifth day in a row where I'm hauling and I'm making less than 10 kilometres in a, in a full 18 hour day. Uh, the snow is thick, um, I'm absolutely uh, getting pummeled, then my morale really struggles and that's that real dig deep. And on this last journey, which I finished in 2020, um, I was crossing a feature called Dome Argus, which you probably see some video of Dome Argus on this film. It's the highest and coldest part of Antarctica, the coldest naturally occurring place on planet Earth. No human being had ever got there on ski or foot. Nobody had ever tried to climb it. And uh, I, this, this is the snow on Dome Argus. So it's light, it's fluffy. The, um, the snow just grips your sled and it will not move absolutely will not move. So you're unable to make more than probably two kilometres with five to ten hours effort and your morale starts to really struggle, your energy levels are, are struggling and on the slopes of Dome Argus I, I made that phone call home to my wife Sarah and said listen I think uh, I'm done, I can't, I can't progress, I can't go backwards, I can't go forwards, I don't have the calories at the rate that I'm doing to get up and over at home and I was in what they call the DNR zone, which is an area where the Russian support team felt that they, they could get a plane to me, but the air was too thin for it to take off. So essentially, you're on your own. If you struggle there, you're probably going to die there. What so, flipped it then? What was the flipping point? What was the, the moment? Was it the motivational talk with the other half? Yeah, well, I, it was quite a maturity in our communication. Previously, our communication was, I would grind a hold, I'd call her, I'd get a bitch slap through the phone, you, you talk yourself into this, talk yourself out of it, um, and then she'd hang up and cry, and I would grow up and uh, uh, get a little tougher the next day. But on this one, I think if she'd done that, she probably would have broken. I was already broken. And we realised um, before the journey that this would be tougher than any journey I'd ever taken on. And we needed to find maturity in our communication. And I remember all she said to me that night was, listen, I know you feel like you're done, but knowing you, I think you've got more. Double your calories and sleep eight hours or less talk in the morning. So I said, okay, well, there's no harm in that. I, I do feel absolutely spent. I don't think she realised at the time how finished I was. But I dug a trench underneath my ski pole with a little yellow ribbon on it. And the yellow ribbon was going downhill away, 100, 180 degrees to the direction that I needed to get under kite power again. I dug a trench facing uphill and just went to bed going, I want to wake up with that ribbon over my trench. Because you're so fatigued, you can't even trust your navigational decisions. So you have to set everything, make it really simple so that in the morning you can pack and go and know that you're going the right direction. Anyway, slept eight hours after a double calorie. So I ate, you know, that night a huge amount of food, two days worth, and you're on 6,000 calories a day. Like a normal adult would use probably 2,500 calories. So a huge amount of energy going in your system. You're sleeping uh, for, a, normally I was sleeping anywhere from three to five hours each night. Eight hours, you feel like a new person in the morning and I could just see the side of the tent flitting. Open the tent fly and saw my little yellow ribbon over my trench. So yes. I just rang Sarah and said, I'm on the move, follow the tracker. So the Garmin inReach was putting a little tracker on there and for the next 22 hours, she could see that slowly working its way uphill. 22 hours later, I got to the top of uh, Dome Argus and dropped the kite uh, for the last time. With that, the morale obviously lifted intensely. And then that was, so what, what was the mark of that part of the journey? Was that the halfway point or you, you still got lots to go at that stage? Yeah, that was 2,600 kilometres. So still 2,600 kilometres from home. So long, long, long way from home, but all downhill from there. You touched on a couple of things in there, a couple of topics in there. So obviously you're looking at your food as your fuel for you. Um, when you start out with those sleds over there, they're pretty packed. What have you got in terms of the, the amount of food that you need to sustain yourself? Do you, do you put an extra 20% of tolerance in there in case you get stuck? How does it work on a food prep? Well, your food, 6,000 calories. If you're jamming it in with high fat, you can get that into about 950 grams. So round that up to a kilo per day. So if I'm going for 80 days, for that journey, I'd, I'd ration for 80 days and I can cut calories probably in the last 10 days. So I might scrimp that out to 90 days, but you're gonna come in skinny. Um, 
So 80 kilos, you know, those sleds, your, your full payload, I could move at the beginning about a 200 kilo sled weight. And that's incredibly heavy. And you're going uphill in deep snow. So without kite power, you're probably covering less than a kilometre per hour man hauling. But as you eat through your food, obviously it's getting lighter. The other thing, you, you need about 400 mils of fuel each day to make your water. So you times that by 80, that's another 30 kilos of fuel. What was the camping site? What was the gear use of that one? Oh, very the old, while the MS provided MSR stove, they are bulletproof. Um, and I'm a nervous traveller, so I carry three stoves because um, one stove is great. I've never had one fail, but if one fails and you're down to one, that gets a little nervous. Without your stove, you're going to die very quickly because you have no water and dehydration there happens very quickly. The air is at 2% humidity. So you, your stove is key. So I always carry that in triplicate. It's a great, great piece of kit. Okay. And then other tech stuff, obviously, you're making those phone calls on a fairly regular basis back to your people in Australia. How do you, what tech gear do you take with you? What do you need in the way of charges or panels or GPS equipment or is it a sat phone? What are you using? Well, because as humans, we're such um, nasty beasties, we've burnt a beautiful hole in the ozone layer over Antarctica. So uh, a solar panel that you would spend eight hours charging a 100 watt lithium bank here will charge in about two hours down there. So it is just, you can watch the, the energy pour into your lithium bank. So from solar is beautiful down there. Uh, you've got 24 hour sunlight. So um, initially I was traveling with the solar panel on the outside of the sled, but the velocity and the smashing was breaking cables because at minus 30, a cable just snaps like a twig. Uh, so then I, I thought, well, I don't need to do that. I'll lay it on the tent at night. And that's driving everything. That 100 watt power bank is driving your satellite phone communication, your Garmin inReach uh, tracker. And on this last trip, I had a 13 kilo Pivotel uh, satellite dish, which I don't think I would travel with again, but it gave us this incredible connectivity. But it had a really interesting effect. On the last journey, I found that I would just call home once a day. And um, I was able to, for the, the first part of the journey, not think of home at all and be really disciplined. And then when I got to halfway, think of home every single hour of the day. So that for that first hour of the day, home is not demoralizing you, you're not feeling like you're getting further away. Once you're over halfway, home is a massive drive. But with the Pivotal Link, I was able to do video call and two things happened. I was unable to separate myself from home and really struggled with the solitude in the first 40 days. And then Sarah had this horrible effect at home where for me, she looks static. She's not changing. She doesn't look tired, or thinner, gaunt. For her watching me, every time I called, I look worse than the day before. And you've got this terrible decline, like Antarctica is killing you for every day you're there on a long journey. So every day I'm getting on the phone, looking more and more debilitated, skinnier, scraggy. She could tell I had dark circles under my eyes. And she started to you know, really be concerned about the decisions I was making under duress. So I don't think the video call is something we repeat got the return route in a way. So that's the morale boosting part. How does that look for that last part? You're getting lighter? Is the kite working better in your favor? How does it look when you're sort of bringing it home over the last week or so? Yeah, I mean, the return journey was amazing in that from the top of Dome Argus, all the weather mapping that we had done indicated that there would be a juncture between two weather systems. So a weather system that carried me to Dome Argus and then a separate weather system that would run along the coast back to my start point in the Russian base, Nova Sky Station, south of South Africa. The problem is when you get two weather systems moving against each other, you'll get a dead zone in the middle. And crossing a dead zone by wind power is impossible. So that was a 300 kilometre dead zone. And based on my struggles getting up the dome, even going down, there was no sort of gravity assist because the snow was so thick. So mentally, I had to prepare for anywhere up to a month of man hauling in that sector. And uh, amazingly, I, I didn't haul a single kilometre on the way home. So 2,600 kilometres of continuous kite pull power down through a couple of trenches, through these um, ice systems called mega genes that nobody had ever seen on ground level before. So they're two kilometres wide, about half a kilometre high of frozen ocean. It just looks like a wave of ice making its way to the coast 
uh, but under compression, it gets these huge ripples on them. And they play with the eyes. You're coming in, you can see them, but your eye really struggles to figure out what's going on. Um, so that was all under wind power. And you'd come into the trough where there'd be a lot of wind turbulence. The ice would be really messy with these big gargoyles called Sastrugi. Um, spooky, spooky place to be alone, knowing nobody's ever been there. And so the final duration in terms of days and weeks and months that you're there doing this journey, the longest sun sport is? Yeah, we were trying to break a guy called Room Getty's record at 4,800 kilometres. And then a guy called Mike Horn broke, did 5,100 kilometres, but he elected to have a meal at the South Pole. I still do not know why he would have done that. So essentially he was not solo at uh, But I still wanted to break his just in case there was any argument. And um, anyway, on the 47th day, I broke the 5,100 kilometre mark and then 58. So a week later, I arrived in over 5,301 kilometres. And in that time, you have not seen another human being face to face? No, 58 days. I, I saw a bird on day three and then literally no sign of human contact, not even a footprint uh, in that time. The Chinese had a station that they had dragged up by tractor to the top of Dome So there is a station there. And unbeknownst to me, they were struggling with... Um, a little virus over in China at the time. So the base was uh, deserted, uh, but there it was open and I was tempted to go in and see what was in there, but I was too scared to lose my unsupported status. Uh, but there was, uh, did I tell you about the, the screen? No, okay, this is a spooky story. So I've, I've dropped the kite uh, after 22 hours. Bear in mind, it, this could be brain fog or altitude. Uh, but I've set the tent up, I've got the stove going, I'm out of my suit, which is up there. That thing was a lifesaver. It's minus 52 Celsius outside. It's warm for Dome Argus. And uh, I'm just settling down, ready to eat. And there's this uh, gong sound, three distinct gongs, and then a blood-curdling human scream, female scream, that went for probably 15 seconds. And all the hair on my body stands up. I'm the most isolated human on planet Earth. The nearest person to me is the Russian Space Centre as it goes off over 400 kilometres above my head. In a circle, there wouldn't be a human within. The South Pole was probably 1,500 kilometres away. And then there's this piercing human scream. No explanation. No, it's all just something up. But so clear that I was I redressed, got my boots on, got the suit back on, went outside, expecting to see footprints or found the source of the gong noise. It was a buckle that had come loose off the Chinese flag and it was smacking into a pole right next to a big steel drum that kind of reverberated. So, okay, I can rationalise that. But where did the human scream come from? Looking for footprints, walked to the front of Kunlun Station and the snow is about a metre and a half up the door. So I kicked that away with my feet, opened the door, yell out, you know, thinking maybe something's been left behind and they've gone completely batshit crazy, which you would if you were left behind there. And uh, there's no one inside, just a, a frozen pair of tiny female boots in the lobby of the station. That's it. So was that the scariest moment of the trip or was that the one where you questioned yourself a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think at that point you're just going, okay, what is going on? I probably need to take a couple of Valium, which I did. I went back to the tent and you're starting to get really panicky because it feels like somebody's sitting on your chest just from the oxygen deck um, with a banshee screaming outside. Um, but I think the scariest moment was probably day 56, um, straying into very, very crevassed ice um, for about two hours and just not really being sure whether I was going to get out of it. Did you have to do a lot of backtracking in places like that, or you just forge on and just take on whatever is thrown at you, or you just got to reset your route and go back again if things you know, don't eventuate into being a path? Yeah, I couldn't see a route behind me, so in that case, I had done that where you walk in the crevasse size and then probe your way back out, um, and sometimes you're probing stuff you've already crossed and amazed that it didn't break on you and kill you. Uh, but I think uh, one of my other heroes, Dixie Danziker, is probably the only explorer on the planet who's done more mileage than me on kite um, in Greenland, Antarctica. He's a Belgian explorer. He did the same route that Simon and I did in 2017 across Greenland and he stepped into a crevasse. So, so he was guiding some clients and 
he was in his tent and just said to them, don't leave this area, there's crevasses in the area, and then seemed to ignore his own advice, uh, advice went out with a shovel to get some ice to make water for them, and they just heard a scream, went out, and it was gone. And the, they had 70 metres of, of rope that they linked together to get to the bottom of the crevasse, still couldn't see a bottom, here, so he's still there, but that really drove home to me how fortunate I've been on those times when I've entered crevasse ice and for those of you who don't understand what a crevasse is it's where ice of any nature bends over a feature it will open up and then fill with light snow across those cracks and often you can't see them until you're on them there's a slight shift in the way that the snow sags and day 56 on this journey i realized i was in an incredibly broken area of ice the sleds were about 120 kilos at that point and my theory was that if I hit them hard and fast, I probably had a better chance than walking. So you are trying, imagine driving a taxi at full speed through a game where you make one wrong move and you're going to disappear in a hole. And so you're just rocketing through trying to pick safe eyes and um, stopping, regathering, doing it again. And two hours later, come out on the safe eyes. And there's no way to research that beforehand because a Google Earth image is not going to help you in any way, shape or form because it's too old and it's changing very regularly or is that stuff that's been thousands of years in the making? No, so it'd be thousands of years. It was a navigational error related to fatigue. And we had um, Bell Gelton Fenzi, Ben Gelton Fenzi out of Tasmania, who's probably Australia's leading glaciologist, climatologist. He had done studies on along my entire route on ice velocity and what we worked out was where ice velocity is like an inch a year you're not going to get crevassing. When you get a gradient on the subterranean rock in Antarctica, that ice speeds up to three or four inches per year, and then you get cracking. So we had a map of ice velocities, and from that I picked safe passageways to try and minimise. Uh, the only way to be 100% sure is to sonar test, which is where you, you do a ping through the ice in front of you. And a lot of expeditions with vehicles will do that. They'll have a bamboo pole with a rubber tyre with a sonar in it, and that will tell them when there's air underneath the ice and don't go there. But uh, obviously, with me on a kite, it's not possible. So we talked about scary moments. I want to talk about the fuck me. This is amazing, happy moments. Those moments where you just realise you are probably the luckiest, most isolated man on the planet right then. Think about those ones. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, every journey has a moment of both extremes, like why am I here, whether it's a, a grizzly bear trying to eat you in Alaska or, or um, the other extreme of that is, you know, this is the most amazing privilege to be here. And I remember travelling under kite, it was moderate strength wind, quite a warm day, I'm, I'm kiting downwind and below about minus 30, Antarctica does this magical thing where all of the, the moisture in the air turns into a little diamond dust. And if the sun is low enough, you get this gold effect. So it feels like you're traveling through a golden dust cloud. And I realize I'm alone, nobody, you know, within thousands of kilometers. And I'm traveling through this golden dust cloud uh, for hours. So, yeah, amazing moment. Um, and obviously, so you get, you've got to the end of that journey. I don't want to know who the first person was you saw at the end of that journey when you rock into camp. Oh, yeah, it's pretty funny, actually, because I... I Coming in, I thought, I haven't seen a human for 58 days. I'm going to hike the first person I see, and it's a Russian uh, mechanic who's just come off. Uh, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, local time, and this mechanic has been working all night, and he's walking back to get a coffee, and doesn't see me rock up. So I've just packed my kite, I've packed my sled, I've pushed it over to a room where they told me I had a bed in, and then this guy walks up, and he's a typical Slavic kind of tough guy, and I just walk up and hug him, and he's there like a brick. I'm going, what the hell is going on? And uh, I just tried to explain. I said, I haven't seen him here in 58 days. And he's gone, no, 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 no hug. <laughs> <laughs> Think he's got yeah, a so word a hug. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so that's, that's the end of that journey. Um, obviously, the last two years with COVID and everything's meant to travel globally has been much more difficult. You've been involved in something in the last few months, though, which has taken you and given you a very different perspective of the terrain that you slugged your way across. So um, I think it's the guys from Chimu Adventures have been doing these Qantas flights up over Antarctica, and Jeff has been on board those flights. They're giving a bit of a documentary about that. So how does it change? Is it is it warming? Does it make the hairs on the back of your neck go? What does it feel like going back over that terrain for 
probably a business class seat, Jeff. Well, I mean, I've got to say, uh, it was humbling in that you're lining up with 200 people to get on an aircraft right after having COVID. So everybody looks like a COVID risk. You're like, do I really want to be in this aircraft? I'd probably rather be solo in Antarctica. Uh, but we have navigated all of that. And then you're over open ocean for six hours. And I'm thinking this is going to be a pollution of my idea of Antarctica. Like to, to see Antarctica with 200 people is going to feel very, very different. But then suddenly you see the absolute magic that happens when people see their first iceberg. And then an hour later you're over crushed ice and then you're over pack ice and then on to slope ice coming up to the Antarctic mainland. And then suddenly you're seeing the mainland ring mountains and then the glaciers beyond. They just go on for kilometres into the distance. And you can feel this electricity in the plane that planet Antarctica is really stirring people's understanding of remoteness and adventure. And I thought I was done with Antarctica. I've covered more miles down there than Shackle and Morse and Scott combined. So I don't need to go back there. And uh, But I've never travelled that eastern sector. So we flew over East Antarctica. It's owned by Australia. There's things like the dry valleys, the Dragalski Ice Tongue, um, incredible things that you would just wouldn't believe were possible on the earth that have never been explored. So to see that again, it just stirred possibly another end. I, I get so much inspiration going, I don't know, it's probably the same for most people, but on international flight, when you recognise the land mass below, you can see the bay that you've maybe been captain or driven around. There's something so inspiring. And I took that land over from Singapore to London. So flying back to London and seeing some of the Karakoram Mountains and that, there's just this feeder of adventure by getting in a plane and doing it again. Um, let's fast forward this a little bit because obviously we're starting to run out of time on this one. Um, Looking at what's coming next. In fact, stop. Monster Trucks. This is the headline. Monster Truck. Why have you got Monster Trucks on the title? Arctic Monster Trucks. Quickly touch on that one. Um, I don't know. That's a curve. The, the Russians. Russians. The Russians. The oh. Russian vehicles. Yes. Well, the, the Monster Trucks in Antarctica are, are basically a highlights that they have jacked up and put these massive wheels on. And it's the, the mainstay of their sort of delivery system. But um, obviously... The Russians, uh, who I was meant to be training with in the Arctic um, next month, and we've had obviously some issues with that. They're a little on the nose. I'm sorry if you're Russian in here at the moment, but um, I didn't feel it was good for my brand to be training with them at the moment. Um, so we've changed that training area to the north of Canada again at the Calouet. So I know how brutal that environment is. So part of me is, is like, do I really want to do this again? You know, you wake up with a, a shroud over your face. It's minus 25 in the tent. It's not like Antarctica where you've got all this incredible solar energy warming the tent. Um, it, it's uncomfortable. It's wet. It drills into your system. But it's what the Arctic Ocean will be like. So I have to train there. And the goal for this next journey is to try and do the first solo unsupported crossing of the Arctic Ocean. So many men have tried that journey and failed and it's become a whole lot more difficult because the ice is so unreliable it's so thin so i have to learn how to negotiate dangerous thin ice uh, in a dry suit i have to create a new way of travel where uh, kites are less reliable because there's not much wind up in the arctic um, so i you know whilst i'm making a commitment i want to train and see what my body's capable of before I put my mouth on the line too much. So look at these sleds over there then. They're comparable to what you might take on this next trip or are they very, very different because of the terrain change? Like very, that? very different. So we've been playing with a carbon fibre. Those are Kevlar. And if you have a look closely at those sleds, they are within probably two days of snapping in half. The, the whole front section is cracked. If I'd had another 200 kilometres, I don't think those sleds would have made it. Um, so I cannot risk that sort of failure in the Arctic because you're on water. Um, if your sleds fail, you sink to your death. So uh, in Antarctica, if they had failed 200 kilometres from the end, potentially I could have got a pick up. But the Arctic doesn't have that option. So the idea with these sleds is they're a catamaran solid configuration for open water. And then when I get to ice, I can change that to a more traditional man hauling. Uh, but also, I don't want to sleep on the ice. I want to sleep on that catamaran so that if the ice fails during the night, you're not falling into the drink, you're just falling into your catamaran. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. I, I'm probably well ahead of myself, but um, obviously I won't publicise a journey unless I'm pretty confident I can do it. Uh, so training's gone well post-COVID era. 
COVID certainly puts a damper. For those of you who've had COVID, you know that um, it's probably not even a good idea to train, falling tyres or doing anything silly for a period. Um, but, you know, the last two years, I think for everyone, has been incredibly tough. Uh, so it's almost like we're coming out of that and to adventure again and inspire people to adventure is really what it's about. It's like, hey, the world's not over. There's some crappy stuff going on. Obviously, we all feel for the Ukrainian people. Uh, but it's still important to try and get out there and inspire people to, to get off the couch and get moving. So what's the timeline for this adventure, this next one? Talk to us the name, what is, what's it called, how are you follow us? The Nanook X Expedition. So Nanook was the king of all bears. So the Inuit people believed that without Nanook's blessing, they would never have success in their hunt. Uh, and if we don't look after Nanook, or the king of the bears, he's the canary in the coal mine. So if we do not reduce carbon emissions by 2030, he will be gone by 2050. So this whole journey is about raising awareness of what we can do in Australia, three very simple things we can do to reduce carbon emissions, to put pressure on politicians around us to reduce carbon emissions, to get off uh, fossil fuels and... I just keep at the prices, that helps, doesn't it? Yeah, that helps a lot. But to help, you know, understand that if we can reduce our carbon level, then uh, little old the nuke, the polar bear's got a future. Um, and that's, you know, I'm in the home of the bear on this one. One of my single biggest risks will be death by polar bear on this journey. So it's a way to raise sort of awareness. Sort of that stuff, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just thinking about this, okay, it is very, it's, like I said at the start, it's quite hard to imagine on a day like today in Brisbane that first taste of what it's like to be out in real winter, real polar sort of Arctic conditions. How can people in this room start to embark on not necessarily that sort of journey, but their own taste of something where maybe the northern lights are above their head or they get the ice pack to walk on? Where would you go as your first stop to go and do that stuff? I think that's a really good question, Ben, in that it's absolutely essential if you're going to do any cold weather stuff, um, spend a bit of money on you on your clothing. Get in the wall there, they've got um, some incredibly clever people in the background buying good products. So there's nothing in there that I wouldn't take on expedition. So work on your, your layering, a good underlayer, a nice wicking layer, um, a warm, maybe puff, your know, Prima Loft jacket, and then a good top layer. And then you are able to be comfortable and happy and down to minus 30, which you're not going to find in Australia. If you get into Perisher Valley, those valleys behind, the wind chill will get down to minus 30 in there. So I, so I could absolutely vouch for that I, we do a trip to the arctic in norway in january for our clients and it can be minus 10s and minus 20s there but there's no moisture so it's not wet at all and the gear doesn't matter you just got to be warm we did a trip to perish and some ice climbing in july and it was two degrees and it was sleety rain and then you realize the value of good quality gear because when you're wet and the wind is blowing 60 k's an hour and you're in a tent for three days you can die in australian conditions much quicker and then the Arctic, so that here is quintessential. They don't call it Perisher Valley because it's, it's a holiday down there. But uh, I mean, it is a great entry point, Perisher Valley, if you're comfortable in managing your sweat and your cold weather survival there, you can then progress to backcountry New Zealand. There's vast plains there. We, we train two to three valleys away from a road. In the first valley, you'll meet a couple of Aussies and tourists. The second valley, some hardcore Kiwis. Third valley, we won't see, see anyone for seven weeks. So it's a phenomenal space to get into a polar-like environment. And then uh, up above the Arctic Circle, there's some magical parts of the... So bring back New Zealand travel. Yeah, we need to open that thing up. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Get the bubble open, get over there, and uh, just in time for winter, it'll be perfect.